Take our Bibles this morning and go to the book of 1 uh, Chronicles, chapter number 21. The book of 1 Chronicles, chapter 21, is where we're going to be today. Thank you, Pastor. I appreciate being here at Pemina Valley once again. And it's, a, it's always a joy and privilege to come. I, I hold your pastor and his family in very high regard. He, he really doesn't even know how high uh, in regard I hold him. And I, I appreciate his spirit. I appreciate his humility. And I, I'm very grateful for what the Lord has done here in this place uh, with you people. And it, uh, it thrills my heart and my soul. Uh, I said in the, in the earlier hour, I pastor the Galilee Baptist Church in Monroe, North Carolina. I, I, uh, I've been there for 23 years. And it's a very unique situation. We, we're in the middle of farming country. We, uh, we said eight miles from one city and eight miles from the next out in the middle of a out of middle soybean fields and cornfields, and very very similar to the terrain here, uh, and the the Lord has allowed us to pastor there. As I said, twenty three years. This is our 50, 50th anniversary at the church, and I have been there for nearly half of the life of the church, and it's been a joy to serve uh, that congregation of people. Uh, my dad, uh, uh, brother Larry Wells, is preaching for us this morning. And I'm glad that Dad was able to come over and spend some time. He's 80 years old. He's still on the road traveling and uh, preaching the Word of God. And just has, uh, I guess he's as fresh now as I've ever heard him uh, when he gets into the Scriptures. And, and I appreciate him. And I was hoping he would get to come up here with me for this trip, but he was just unable to do so. But uh, we're, we're thankful. So I pastor in North Carolina. Our church is on the state line, nearly on the state line. And so I live in South Carolina. We have a little farm down in South Carolina. And I, I pastor the church and then I work uh, for the, uh, the sheriff's office in our county. I'm a deputy sheriff in that county. And what uh, the, the, I have a great sheriff who allows me the opportunity to take the time off to minister and has never hindered that in any way. And I'm a, a blessed man to be able to do both of those things and minister to the community in all of those ways. And I always have a good time uh, doing that. I was recently on a... You, you, you get a lot of entertainment. I, I, you know, I don't go to the movies. I, that's, if you do, that's fine. I don't go to the movies. And I rarely get any entertainment. The entertainment I get is from what I see at church. <laughs> and, uh, and, of course, being a deputy sheriff, what you see you know, as a deputy sheriff, you get a lot of entertainment out of that as well. And I was on a call here recently, and, and um, I was, I, I normally, as an old guy, I just, I, I help the young guys out. I have, a, I have an area of responsibility that I'm responsible for in, the, in uh, our county's 800 square miles, and I'm, I'm covering half of that every day, and so I drive a lot. And so I happened to be in an area where the, this call came out. And so the call was about two old men that were getting ready to fight. And so I thought, this ought to be interesting. And so... Uh, <laughs> So I, I strolled over there, and one of them's 80, you know, and he can't hear. And the other one is like 75, and he's only got one leg. And so I thought, this would really be a good fight to watch. So um, I slid in there, and uh, so I went up to the first old man who can't hear and began to scream at him and to say, uh, you know, so uh, what's going on? He said, He's parking in my driveway. It was a flea market, you know, one of those places where you sell junk. He said, he's, he's parking in my driveway and nobody can see all my stuff here in my store. I said, well, first of all, he's not parking in your driveway. He's in the parking lot. And I've been here for 23 years and everybody in this entire county knows where your junk's at. We all know. I said, if you want him gone, talk to the landlord and have him trespassed. Okay. So I went to the other guy. I said, what, what are you doing here? He said, I'm just sitting here. And if that old man comes over here, I'm going to knock him out. Do you understand me? I said, you can't do that. He said, well, if he comes over here and says anything to me, I'm going to knock him out. I said, well, you know that Jesus would not be pleased with that. He said, you're right, but I'm probably going to do it anyway, he said. To which I responded, you don't need to do that because I'm going to have to arrest you if you do that. He said, yeah, I know it, I know it. I said, I don't want to arrest you. He said, why not? I said, well, it's lunchtime and I'm hungry and I don't want to miss lunch by arresting you. He said, all right. I said, plus, if he arrests you, you're going to have to go to court, right? He said, yeah. 
I said, guess what happens if you go to court? He said, what? I said, you ain't got a leg to stand on. <laughs> to which he began to laugh and pulled off, and it's, it, was, it all worked out good. So you have all of those kinds of wonderful things that you get to, to laugh about, and then there's a lot of things to cry about in people's lives as well. But it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity, and I appreciate it. All right, the book of First Chronicles, chapter 21, First, First Chronicles 21, we'll read a handful of verses today down, uh, we'll skip around, but we'll read down through verse 13. Beginning in verse 1, the Bible makes this statement. The Bible said, and, and Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people, go number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. Whenever you see the, the, uh, the phrase Dan to Beersheba or Beersheba to Dan in the scripture, it is referencing the, the boundaries of the nation of Israel. In other words, it is saying from sea to shining sea. In other words, from one end to the other, up and down, back and forth, encompassing the whole land. So from Dan to Beersheba, I want to know how many people we've got. Now look down with me, if you would, to verse 7. The Bible said in verse 7, and God was displeased with this thing, this numbering business. Therefore he smote Israel. And David said unto God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. But now I beseech thee, do away with the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. And the Lord spake unto Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So Gad came to David and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Choose thee, and here's the choices, either three years famine, or three months to be destroyed before thy foes, while that the sword of thine enemies overtaketh thee. Or else three days the sword of the Lord, even the pestilence in the land. And, and the, the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the coasts of Israel. Now therefore advise thyself what word I shall bring again to him that sent me. And David said unto Gad... I am in a great strait. Let me now fall into the hand of the Lord, for very great are his mercies, but let me not fall into the hand of man. Let's pray and see what the Lord might grant us today. Father, I want to thank you for the day, and I want to thank you for your blessings on us today. I want to thank you for your word and the blessings of it. Thank you that we have the freedom of having the Word of God as our, uh, as our guide and our stay. And I pray, dear Lord, that you'll give us wisdom and leadership and guidance and direction. Help us to be able to minister to the need of the congregation today in a way that would be pleasing and would be honoring to Christ. We ask all these things, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen and amen. I want to start this morning by talking about one of my favorite subjects and one of my favorite subjects is the Word of God. I, I love the Bible. I, I told the men over the weekend that I, I've read the Bible cover to cover probably 50 plus times. I love it. I appreciate it. I, I'm no longer what you would consider to be a novice in the understanding it. I, I have plowed through it time and again, and I, I, I study it, and I, and I have a, a great affinity in my heart for the Word of God. I believe it. I believe every word of it. I believe it when it says Holy Bible on the front of it. I believe it. And I appreciate it. And someone once said, uh, do, you, uh, do, you, do you defend the Bible? Do you, do you defend the Word of God? And Dr. James Crumpton was asked that one time, do you defend the Bible? He said, no, I don't defend it. He said, I don't defend it. And they said, well, why do you not defend the King James Bible? Why do you not defend the Word of God? He said, I... I don't, I don't defend it, just like you don't defend a lion. You don't defend a lion, you just turn him loose and let him do his job. You take the Word of God and turn it loose, and it'll do its job. 
I appreciate the Word of God and what it means to me. There are 66 books of, of a library in your lap, and you ought to be acquainted with every book. There are 39 Old Testament books and 27 new, 1,189 chapters, 31,102 verses, 788,000 280 words, and you ought to know all of them. You ought to be familiar with all of them. I was intrigued one time with what the center of the Word of God might be, and I, I found it to be Psalms 103, verse 1 and 2, where the Bible made this statement. It said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. And then he said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of His benefits. I found that there is really not one center word in the Word of God, but rather in the center of the Word of God is a phrase. The center of your Bible basically says this by way of a four-word phrase, bless His holy name. That's what the Word of God is about. It is His Word about Himself. And when you look in the book of Psalms, chapter number 138, in verse number 2, the psalmist said that I will worship toward thy holy hill, thy holy temple, and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. He said, because you have magnified, thou hast magnified thy word above thy name. We are blessing his holy name, but we are considering the fact that he has magnified his word, the inspired, infallible, inerrant, preserved word of the living God. He's magnified it above his name. This book that you have in your lap has every Every, uh, every mode of success in it. If you want to be a successful dad, go to the Word of God. If you want to be a successful husband or wife, go to the Word of God. You, you want to have your health to be successful, go to the Word of God. You want your pocketbook to be successful when it comes to your financial management, go to the Word of God. You want to know about God's church, go to the Word of God. You want to know what God has to say about himself? Go to the word of God. You cannot overemphasize the word of the living God. It is extremely important. And it is the most important thing to me in my life. Uh, the Bible said in Hebrews chapter 4, in verse number 12, about the word of God. He said that the word of God is quick and it is powerful. The word quick there not meaning fast, but rather living or alive. He said the word of God is quick and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And it, and it has the ability of piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joint and marrow. And what does it do? It discerns the thoughts and the intents of my heart. Do, do you want to know who you are? Look at the word of God. Do you want to know what you are? Look at the word of God. You want to know why you're motivated the way you're motivated Look to the Word of God. Let it be the mirror that, re, that allows you to see your reflection inside of its holy pages. The Bible made this statement in John chapter 17 in what we consider the Lord's Prayer, not the model prayer of Matthew 6 and Luke 4, but in the, in the, in the, in, or Luke 11, but in the, in the Lord's Prayer in John 17. Jesus has finished the Lord's Supper with his disciples. He's washed their feet. And he gives them a discourse in John 14, 15, and 16 about his leaving the Holy Spirit of God coming and what they could expect. Then in chapter 17, before they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Christ will pray for three hours about the cup that is coming to him, Jesus prays a prayer to his Father. And in that prayer, in verse number 17 of chapter 17 of John, here's what he said. He said, Lord, sanctify them through thy truth. In other words, Lord, what will set the people apart? What will clean them and set them apart is the truth. And then he said this, identifying the truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. And then here's what he said. Thy word is truth. In other words, the word of God has cleansing power to cleanse us. Well, that's what Ephesians 5 says. 26 said that he might sanctify and cleanse them by the washing of water by the word of God. And so the word of God is extremely important. Someone said, you read so much of the word of God every day. How can you, how can you remember it all or how can you retain it all? 
The truth is, I, 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 I take the word of God in just like I do a meal. I couldn't tell you what I ate three Wednesdays ago at lunchtime, but I can tell you it was good because I don't eat bad food. And I can tell you that it nourished me and I received strength from it. I may not be able to remember every little jot or tittle of what I've read from the Word of God today, but it is all good and it has nourished my spiritual man. And I must have it as a regular part of my spiritual diet or I will famish and faint away. I love, as one of my favorite chapters in the Word of God, I love Psalm 119. I've read it over and over and over and over again. I love what it says. The entirety of Psalms 119 really deals with the Word of God and its place in the believer's life. Psalms 119 and verse number 9 said, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Psalms 119 and 11 said, Thy word, I've hid it. I've hid the word of God in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against thee. And then again in verse 89, the Bible said, Forever, O Lord, forever, thy word is settled in heaven. I've signed several little Bibles for young folks here today, and I'm always honored to do that. And I don't think I'm worthy of doing that. I only request that they, they mention my name in prayer when they happen to see my name. I, I'm just a worthless piece of dirt. I'm a nothing individual without the Lord. But one of the things that God has done in me is he has taken that word, he has convicted me, as pastors already said, faith came to me by hearing, and hearing was by the word of the living God. God did his work in my life. All of the work that he's done in my life has been through the word of God and my adherence to what God's word has had to say. It is my life. The word of God is not a part of my life. The word of God is my life. I carry it within me. I memorize it. I read it. I seek after it. It's important. I understand that if there is failure in my life, the failure is going to be as a result of my, uh, my lack of co uh, complicity with the Word of God or my lack of understanding, my comprehension of what the Word of God has to say and then I am not obeying it. I have signed those Bibles, Isaiah 40 and verse 8. The Bible said the grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. The Bible said that when we stand at the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to be judged out of books. And I do believe with all my heart that my judgment at the judgment seat of Christ is going to be based on what the word of God has to say that my Christian life ought to have been. And then we will reflect upon what it has been. In the book of Psalms 119, we're told to do some things with our whole heart. And what we are told to do with our whole heart is to embrace the Word of God with our whole heart. How do we do that? Psalms 119 verse 2 said that we are to seek after God with our whole heart. Psalms 119 verse 10 said that with our whole heart we have sought after God. And then in Psalms 119 verse 58 I entreated thy favor with my whole heart. In other words, I am seeking God, entreating God's favor. I found it in the word of God. In Psalms 119 verse 145, I cried unto God with my whole heart. In other words, what we must do is take the word of God and seek after God with everything that we have within our being. And then... The second thing that God tells us to do with the whole heart in Psalms 119 is to submit to what we find. In Psalms 119.34, he said, I, I've sought your law, and he said, I'm going to observe it with my whole heart. In other words, I'm going to submit to what I find in the word of God and let it carry me safely from this life unto the next. Again, he said in Psalms 119.69, that I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. So with the word of God, what must I do? I must seek after God's mind in it, and then I must submit myself to it. There are many today who don't want to know what the word of God has to say because they know that it will bring them to a crucial point in life where that they're going to have to, at this crucible, 
decide are they going to obey God and submit themselves to Him? Or are they going to reject God and live in rebellion against God? And so the Word of God is true and it's right, it's real, it's relevant, and it will ready you for living in this life. Now, let, let's consider something today, if we may. Let's consider the story that we read. So I, I just want to spend a moment of time. We won't be awfully long here this morning. So the story that I read in your hearing out of 1 Chronicles chapter number 21 is found in a parallel text, and that parallel text, of course, is in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 24. And in both of these stories, they are basically the same with a, a few of the idiosyncrasies that are slightly different. But the stories historically are the same. So David has gone to Joab and he's gathered the captains together. And he said, I, I have a desire. And Joab said, well, well, your majesty, what's your desire? He said, I, I want to know how many people we have out there. I, wa I want you to do a census. I want you to go count the men of Israel. Go count our fighting men. I need to know how many, what is the number of our fighting men? Would you go get that done? Now Joab, in a spiritual moment, which he rarely had, turned to the king and he said, King, is that not God's business? Sir, I don't mean to be disrespectful to you, um, but you know, we've always had enough. God's always supplied the need. We've always received whatever we needed at, at the time of battle, and God's always graciously taken care of the problem. Is that not God's business? Let's just, let's leave that in the hand of God. But David's word won out, and Joab went to count the people. David is out counting all, or Joab and the captains of the, ho captains of the people are counting the people, and they bring the tally back in after having gone from Dan to Beersheba, and they lay it before David. As they lay the tally before David, I think it's 1.2 million or somewhere in that neighborhood. I can't remember offhand. But they lay the tally before David. As the tally is laid before David, David's heart is immediately smitten by God that he has done something wrong. When he realizes that he has done something wrong, he is very repentant. And that is one of the reasons why I believe that David was such a man after God's own heart. He was sensitive to know when he had done wrong. And when he did wrong, he would then begin to repent and get his heart right. So he repented. And as David repented, uh, it wasn't long before he received a guest into the palace. The guest was a, a seer, a prophet, the name of Gad. Gad said, Your Majesty, I've come to you with a word from the Lord. David said, Well, what is the word from the Lord that you have for me? He said, The word from the Lord is this, and I, I hate to bring it to you, sir, but here's what God said. Because you have done this, because you have done what you have done today, I am giving you an option. You're going to fall under the chastisement of God. You're going to fall under the hand of God's judgment. And sir, he's giving you options in regard to judgment and it will be up to you to choose. David says, well, what are the options? He said, well, number one, sir, is that you'll be in famine. You're going to go into a state of famine and if you look in the text, you'll have three years of it. Three years of famine. What's the next choice? Well, the next choice is you're going to run for three months from your enemies and their sword will prevail against the nation of Israel. It will prevail against us for three months and there will be bloodshed and slaughter. He said, what's the third option? He said, the third option is a pestilence is going to come for three days from the Lord and it will be called the sword of the Lord. And God will walk through the nation from Dan to Beersheba. And God will do his work in regard to this situation. David, looking at the three choices, says, Well, I, I remember the story of the children of Israel in Egypt. And I remember the story of the famine. And I've been acquainted with that. I, I don't think I want to choose that. I, I, I don't want to run before the Philistines, our enemies, and allow their sword to overcome us and and be a laughing stock to the nation, 
to the nations around us in regard to them looking at our God as if He were nothing. We've relied upon Him to this date and if they were to defeat us for three months, it would be a terrible thing. David says this. He says, let me fall into the hand of the Lord. Let God do whatever it is He's going to do. Let, let His sword come. Let the pestilence come. Let the hand of God rest upon us for three days and let's see what comes out of that. And David leaves it in the hand of the Lord. Now that night, the pestilence begins. Let's say, for the sake of let's saying that began in Dan, and the angel of the Lord came through, and one at a time, houses were visited, and people were dead and dying. And there were so many people that died, thousands, tens and tens of thousands of men were dying. I can see as Ariuna the Jebusite whom David will eventually buy the threshing floor of. He wakes up in the morning and he hears a noise buzzing in the air. and Someone comes riding into the threshing floor in the middle of the day and says, you ain't going to believe what's happening. The angel of the Lord is sweeping through the nation. Men are dying by the hundreds. Men are dying everywhere and he's coming this way. When it comes the second day, more word comes in of more people being slain by the pestilence of the Lord, the sword of the Lord sweeping through. There are now a few thousand, few thousand have been, been killed by the pestilence that God has sent through in judgment. By the third day, the Bible said that David and the uh, elders of Israel have made their way out to where Ornan or Arayuna's threshing floor is. The angel of the Lord is standing above the threshing floor with a bloody sword in hand. Ariuna, his name also is Ornan. He is no doubt in the middle of the threshing floor. His life and the life of his sons are soon to be reaped, but David falls upon his face and they begin to cry before the Lord. And God stays his hand and the judgment is over. But there are somewhere close to 70,000 people that are dead as a result of this travesty of mistake made by David. So the question then now bears in our mind, what really was this mistake David made? Go with me to the book of Exodus chapter number 30. Exodus chapter 30. And let me go somewhere with you today in the word of God. In Exodus 30, God is giving Moses the law. And in the Pentateuch, God gave the law in regard to everything in the life of the children of Israel. He dealt with their diet. He dealt with how to die. He dealt with leprosy. He dealt with numbers of things in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. In Exodus chapter 30, beginning in verse 11, here's what God said. Look with me if you would. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, When thou takest a sum of the children of Israel after their number, then shalt thou give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord, when thou numberest them. Why? That no plague, that no, there be no plague among them when thou numberest them. This they shall give. Every one that passeth among them that are numbered, half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. He says, A shekel is twenty giras, and half shekel shall be the offering of the Lord. Verse 14. Every one that passeth among them that are numbered, from twenty years old and above, shall give an offering unto the Lord. The rich shall not give more, the poor shall not give less than half a shekel. Let's stop right there. The law of God said this. You can number the people anytime you want to. There is no problem with you numbering the people. I don't have a problem with you finding out once a month if that's what you want to do. I don't have a problem if you number them every other year. God said, it's not a matter of how often you number the people. 
It's a matter of how you number the people. He said, when the leaders of the people number the people, always remember this. You must collect for every man that is numbered a half a shekel or 20 giras, and that half a shekel or 20 giras is considered a ransom money to go into the coffers of the Lord. He said the poor will not give less than a half a shekel. The rich won't give more than a half a shekel. It is a measly bit of money, but it is to be given for the census. So when you go and you count the people, you must collect from the people this census money to be given to the Lord. He says in the text, if you look very closely, if you don't do this, then a plague from the Lord is going to come upon the nation because you disobey him in the numbering of the people in verse number 12. Now you have your Bible with you. Go to the Deuteronomy 17. So here's what I know. David was not wrong in numbering the people. David was wrong in how he numbered the people. Now go with me to Deuteronomy 17. In Deuteronomy 17, in essence, here's what the Lord is saying. He is saying, I, I desire that the, that the governmental structure of the nation of Israel, I, I desire that it be a government ran by me. I, I want to be in charge of the government. I, I, I desire that we live in a theocracy where God is in charge. That's what God said. However... God, in his foreknowledge, knew that Israel would demand a king. Now notice what God does. A long time, several hundred years before a king is ever selected, the Lord laid down the qualifications for the king. Look in Deuteronomy chapter number 17 and look down with me in verse number 14. When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me, like as all the other nations that are about me. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. But he shall, notice the qualifications, but he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause thy, the people to return to Egypt to the end that, they should that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. Verse 17. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. Now pay attention at verse 18 and 19. And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. Verse 19. And it shall be with him and he shall read therein all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. So the qualification for every king of Israel was in this manner. Number one, if you're going to be a king over the nation of Israel, number one, you are not to multiply horses to yourself. Now the reason that he said don't multiply horses to yourself, it was not that God was against them riding horse or taking a horse into battle. But he did not, the place to get horses was Egypt. He said, I don't want you going down into Egypt. It'll turn the hearts of the people away from God. So don't multiply horses to yourself. Okay, that's easy enough. Number two, do not multiply gold and silver unto yourself. I do not want you becoming, as a king, a filthy fat cat guy. I don't want you being a rich guy because wealth and riches will turn your heart from God. Number three. The third qualification is 
Do not multiply wives unto yourself. You as king over Israel are to be a one woman man. You're not to live in polygamy. You're to be a one woman man. The fourth qualification is in this manner. The fourth thing is I want you to go take the law of Moses as king. I want you to take parchment and pen and I want you to write in your own handwriting the law of Moses before you and I want you to read it every day of your life. You write it, you read it every day. You write it, you read it. It is important to you. Now, why did David number the people and not do it right? Because David had no idea what the Word of God had to say about that matter. David had no idea what the Word of God had to say about the multiple wives he had. David had no idea what the Word of God had to say about the multiple horses that he had. David had no idea what the word of God had to say about the multiplying of money to himself because when he wrote the check out to be put in the coffers for the building of Solomon's temple, he wrote a personal check for over a hundred million dollars. David was a, an extremely wealthy individual. He had violated all four of the kingly qualifications. As a matter of fact, you will not find one qualified king in the nation of Israel because they did not know the word of God, they did not write it down, and they did not submit themselves to every jot and tittle of the word of God because God's word said to obey all that is found therein. So when David numbered the people, there is not one indication that he ever collected not one shekel, let not one half a shekel, from any of the people that he numbered. And the promise of God was, if you don't, a pestilence comes. If you don't, a plague comes. Why did the plague come from God on the nation of Israel? Because its leadership did not know what the word of God had to say and did not submit themselves to it. So let me ask you this question, and I'm done this morning. Let me ask you this question. Number one, do you know, as a Christian, do you know what the Word of God says? Are you familiar with the Word of God? Do you have a daily relationship with the Word of God? Is it leading you? Is it guiding you? Is it giving you the faith that you need to, to, to make it through tomorrow? Is it the answer book for the problems that you face in life? Because you are going to face problems. Do you know it? Do you know the book? Secondarily, if your family goes through some plague tomorrow, some kind of an incident tomorrow, will it be because you don't know what God's Word says? and you haven't submitted yourself to the Word of God, a tragedy that could have been averted had you have been submissive to God's Word. God says, as newborn babes, we naturally desire the milk of this Word that we may grow thereby. If, you're a, if you claim to be a child of God and you have zero desire for God's word, I would go examine myself to see whether I be in the faith. Christ Jesus said this himself, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. I'm not saved because I had an encounter with a man I'm not saved because I had an encounter with a church. I'm not born again and heaven bound because I submitted to a creed or said a prayer. I am saved by the grace of God because I have submitted myself to what that book says about me being a sinner and about him being a savior. 
I've called upon the Lord from the heart. I'm saved because I know His Word. And I'm placing faith and trust in what His Word said. Why is my success, my, my, my Christian life, I think it is fairly successful. Why is it successful? Is it because of my personality or my fortitude? Absolutely not. I'm a very weak man. My Christian life is successful as will yours be or as yours is because the Word of God has its integral place in your life. Let's stand our feet. As the pastor comes for invitation and however that is conducted here, thank you ladies. As we bow our heads today, as Pastor Sullivan descends the platform, let me ask this question. Does the Word of God have place in your heart? And then secondly, are you submitted to what it says? Pastor.